I'm um, going to talk a little bit this morning, first hour, about the Puritans, uh, primarily the American Puritans in New England. Um, I will be skimming the surface of a lot of history, and I'll try to do it in a way that is interesting and relevant. Uh, this afternoon, I'll talk about my favorite theologian, Jonathan Edwards, and um, I, again, a massive subject. Uh, in, in this morning's presentation about the New England Puritans, this is the question that I will be dealing with. What are the biblical grounds for church membership? Who should be a member of the church? Uh, what is it that the church is to be? And then when we get to Edwards this afternoon, what is it that makes a person a Christian? What makes a person a Christian? Um, the name Puritan, the word Puritan, as uh, you can guess, is closely related to the desire of many Christians in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries to uh, purify the church, to make it a, a pure place, uh, to, to get rid of all of the impurities. And as you can guess, that started in 1517 when Martin Luther um, had his uh, nailing of the theses to the castle door in Wittenberg, Germany. Um, but we need to keep in mind that um, Martin Luther himself did not leave the Roman Catholic Church. We, we often talk about him as though he up and left because he thought it was so bad. Not true. He um, stayed in the Roman Catholic Church preaching against its impurities until he was excommunicated on January 3, 1521. That's a very interesting point. He did not leave. He stayed and preached against what he thought was wrong until they cast him out. And casting him out really opened the floodgates of the creation of many different churches in Europe in the uh, mid-16th century. Uh, for example, one of the great reformers was uh, Ulrich Zwingli, and he and Luther had just terrible disagreements over the nature of the Lord's Supper. Um, what does it mean when, when you say, when the minister says, this is my body in the, in the uh, communion service? Uh, Luther was really still enough of a Catholic that he thought something really happened to that bread and that wine. Zwingli said, no, it did not. And wh whether you agree with either of those, the, the point is that very quickly, Luther's leaving or being expelled from the Roman Catholic Church created a kind of chaos among Protestants as you had split upon split upon split. Um, move over a little bit to England now. In the 1530s and 40s, um, you probably know that uh, that church renounced its Roman Catholic ties in uh, 1545, but it did not do so because of theological concerns. Um, the ruler, you, you've all heard of good old Henry VIII, and uh, he wanted another wife, and the pope wouldn't give him one, and so he said, you're no longer the head of our church. Uh, am I doing something wrong again? If you take this and just lower that a couple inches, that, oh, might, more, help. More, that, more, that more. Okay. might help. That might help it out. Better? We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Um, so, so what that meant was that the English Reformed Church still contained many Roman Catholic elements uh, because Henry didn't leave the, leave, leave them out because uh, over theological issues. Um, there were many battles in the English Puritan Church uh, over doctrine. But the final official result was a, a document called the 39 Articles, approved in 1571. It's as solid a reformed document as you're likely to find anywhere. It is excellent. 
And uh, there are now in, in the world uh, many, many conservative, very conservative Anglicans. I, I attended a conference in Jerusalem in, uh, in June, uh, a group uh, representing 50 million evangelical Anglicans. So, so there's a, a very strong uh, doctrinal uh, faithfulness within the global Anglican church. Um, however, it's not just over theology and doctrine that splits sometimes come. In, um, in England, for example, the biggest uh, controversy in, in the church, in the Reformed Puritan church, was over what the minister wore in the pulpit. Uh, I see you're laughing at that. Yes. <clears throat> that, that, that um, it it does, does, uh, does seem funny. It was called the vestments controversy. To be specific, um, the, uh, the, the requirement of ministers was that they wear a surplus, a sort of white shawl-like thing, before they go into the pulpit. And um, some Christians in England felt that they needed to purify the church further and get rid of the use of that particular garment. It reminds me a little bit of um, many, many years ago. I grew up in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and my, uh, my grandmother, a very solid, wonderful Christian woman, was visiting from Knoxville, Tennessee. <coughs> And our, our minister wore a Geneva robe in the pulpit. And as soon as Granny saw that, she said, that man's coattails are in hell. <clears throat> so concern about what people do or do not wear in the pulpit um, is not restricted to the 16th century. How important is it? How important is it? What is it? that is worth splitting over, shall we say. Um, but even those who agree, agreed on um, theology in England could not agree as to when it was appropriate to split the church. There were some who, who felt that even if you took away the surplus, even if you had Calvinistic theology, that wasn't enough. You had to do more. They were called separatists. Now, um, let me come now to the, to the New World, and I'll give you an example of what separatism might be. The desire for increasing amounts of purity in the church led many English Puritans to come to America. The first two main reformed groups were the Pilgrims, who settled in Plymouth, Massachusetts, in 1620. They were, they were separatists, separatists. The emphasis on, in there was on, on the complete freedom of the individual to live as they felt scripture required. Um, much larger group came to the Boston area. And they were called American Puritans. They had far greater impact on American society. The, uh, the Boston group gradually assimilated the Plymouth group. Um, but one of the major controversies in the early Massachusetts uh, church was over a man named Roger Williams. Roger Williams. Um, if you uh, ever travel to Providence, Rhode Island, you'll see on the top of the Capitol a statue of the independent man. Uh, Roger Williams was, if anything, an independent man. He moved from Boston to the Providence area because he felt that the church in Boston was not as pure as it should be. They were, they were not uh, as intensive as the scriptures required them to be in making certain that only saints were in the church. Well, he got to Providence, 
and he had a, um, a revelation. He, he realized then that um, he could not be sure that his wife was saved. And therefore, because he could not be sure that she was saved, he refused ever to pray with her again. You see how far the, the, the desire to be in fellowship only with those whom you know are saints, how far that desire can take you. It, it was, if anything, extreme, extreme separatism. Let me stop for just a moment to um, say that one of my personal concerns about Christianity globally right now is um, this very kind of thing. The, the tendency to split and split and split over this matter, this smaller matter, this smaller matter. I don't know uh, the statistics for the reformed communities like yours. I do know that right now there are 29 American Presbyterian denominations. Do we need 29 denominations of Presbyterians? Do we need 29 Presbyterians? That's another question. Um, <laughs> and and, and if, that's not, if that's not revelatory enough, probably the most um, reformed, Christianly speaking, community in the world is South Korea. Um, it, it is and very Presbyterian. The uh, fact of the matter is that if you walk down the streets of Seoul, every fourth person you meet will be a Presbyterian. Um, and yet, as good as that sounds, there are today 103 Presbyterian denominations in South Korea. I was talking to Mark um, before the service. Uh, I had the privilege of preaching uh, in a small church on the Isle of Skye in Scotland in May. Come into that little town of 200 people. And you, you come into the town, and the first thing you see is a um, free Presbyterian church. And you go down another block, and there's the Free Church of Scotland. And then below that is the Free Church of Scotland continuing. And then there's a Church of Scotland. 200 people. Do you need that many churches? And, and frequently, you know, we, we tend to, when we go, we tend to um, rent a, a house there, uh, self-catering. And I have, on more than one occasion, asked people in one of those denominations, what's the difference between your denomination and that one? Never, never get a decent kind of answer. Um, but let's get back to the subject of New England. I, I'm, I'm just indicating where this kind of problem has taken us today. The Massachusetts Puritans, uh, Roger Williams is gone now, we're talking about the main body of Puritans in, in Boston, still saw themselves, this is interesting, still saw themselves as part of the Church of England. They were still part of that church, but because they were geographically removed, they had the opportunity to structure their church in a way that they thought most appropriate. And that's, that's what they did. Um, there are a number of key and defining elements, very interesting elements, I think, in uh, Massachusetts in the 1630s. Um, June 12, 1630, the first major ship of Puritans arrives in Boston, June 12, 1630. Uh, October 29, 1630, critical date. Because they are so far from England, they can decide that the only people who can vote in public elections are church members. Now, <laughs> It's, it's really interesting. That did not mean that 
a smaller percentage had the vote in New England than had it in England. In England, the only people who could vote in public elections were those who owned property on which the tax was 40 shillings or more every year. Same percentages. In England, it was economy based. In New England, it was spiritually based, at least that was the intention. Only, only church members could vote as of October 29, 1630. Something else happened in 1630 that um, proved to be quite important. One was very unimportant, that was the founding of that old school, Harvard. Uh, we don't like Harvard at all. Um, I attended a different school. Um, but uh, also in that year, the, uh, the community adopted a new criterion for church membership. A new criterion for church. Remember now, you, you can't vote in political elections unless you're a church member. And so the next step was to clarify, well, who can be a member of the church? The Boston church created the, the requirement of what they called a narrative of grace. We would call it a personal testimony. Um, th that was a, a dramatic change in the, way in, ch in the way in which church membership was determined. In, um, in England, you were a member of the church if you were born and uh, reared in the church and you were an English person. You never had to demonstrate anything about your personal spirituality. In New England, that was a key. That was also a key for political reasons. They wanted, they wanted New England to be a holy commonwealth. The, the, the terminology was, we want to be a city set on a hill that the world will see what Christians can make of a, of a community. I have uh, indicated on your outline, there's a, a wonderful little book by Edmund Morgan. Uh, he's now deceased. He was a professor at Yale. Uh, had the privilege of knowing him and working with him. Um, and his book is entitled Visible Saints, the History of a Puritan Idea. The Puritans were really the first that I know of in history to seek to be sure that the church was made up of saints, visible saints. In England, the emphasis, when, when there was fussing about um, whether the church was pure enough, the focus was on the ministers, what the minister wore, what the minister believed, what the minister did. Now, that was still important, as we see later, in New England, but they took the next step of saying it's critically important who are the members of the church because they're the ones who elect the next pastor. They're the ones who really control the future of the church. And uh, I will spend some more time this afternoon talking about the way in which Jonathan Edwards worked on this particular criterion, why I think that's the most important criterion um, that, that, we can, uh, that we can discuss. Six, all that was in 1636. They just arrived. And uh, it was remarkable, all that they did within that, within that first year. In 1637, you have the first, <laughs> amazing, one year, the first theological controversy in New England. It didn't take them long to begin fighting over doctrine. Um, and, and this one is particularly interesting to me because it, it embodies um, a, a problem that all of us Calvinists face. Um, if God is sovereign in salvation, if God does it, do we need to obey the moral law of scripture? If so, why? 
I mean, God's already elected us. He's already saved us. Um, his salvation cannot be lost. If God is sovereign in salvation, then why does it matter at all what we do in our Christian lives? Um, the uh, minister of the largest church in Boston was, um, was named John Cotton. John Cotton. And uh, he had been one of the primary proponents of the introduction of this criterion for church membership called a narrative of grace. Um, the, the controversy arose when he began to preach sermons trying to identify why obedience to scripture was still very important. And the issue, the specific issue that came up was whether, when you, when you give your narrative of grace, when you come in and testify that you've experienced the grace of Jesus Christ, should your obedience to the moral law count as part of that narrative of grace? Well, if it does count, aren't you in danger of mitigating or destroying God's sovereignty? Because then your, your actions become part of the ground for your being identified as a saint. Um, the, um, and, and Cotton was, Cotton tended to say, uh, it's important to obey, but that has nothing to do with whether you are eligible to be a member of the church. That's totally your experience of grace. That's it. One of the um, members of his church was a woman named Ann Hutchinson. And uh, Mrs. Hutchinson um, began having meetings in her home during the week after John Cotton preached in which she sought to explain his very dense, heavy sermons to other people. And as she explained those sermons, she communicated that obedience didn't count at all. It, it wasn't important at all. If God's sovereignty is going to be maintained, you, you can't talk about anything that we do or don't do. You just can't. And um, this, therefore, uh, became the ground of what's been called the antinomian controversy, the first major theological controversy in the American church. Why in the world do we worry about that now? Well, um, when I first went to uh, Westminster Seminary on the faculty, there was a controversy focusing on that very issue. Um, and, and I'm trying to be fair and open about this uh, as to whether the, the, the ultimate decision was that one of the professors at the seminary was making obedience more important than it should be, and he was fired. This was 1980s. Um, and over and over and over again, particularly in our reformed church, that issue has come up. How, how, do, you, how do you talk meaningfully about the importance of your obedience to scripture if God is sovereign in salvation? I'll give you a hint. Edwards answers that question, but you've got to come back this afternoon to get that answer. <laughs> um, but, but 
really, the church was less than a year old. They, they, they believed the Bible. They, they believed all the things that, that we believe about God and Jesus and, and salvation. And one year on, the colony is split over antinomian, the antinomian controversy. Uh, moving on just a bit, if you uh, remember your uh, church history, you'll know that from 1643 to 1648, there was an important meeting in London, England, which has now been called the Westminster Assembly. Um, <laughs> a number of the New England Puritans were invited to go to the meeting. They declined. They declined. Why? Well, their perception was that the Westminster Assembly was too Presbyterian. And they didn't want anything to do with it. Well, what's so bad about Presbyterian? Really, come on now. I mean, he was OPC, I'm OPC, you know, what's so bad? Well, it, it, it's a matter of the, the, the time that the issue is raised. In the 1640s, the only form of Presbyterianism that was known was that in Scotland where the king was the head of the church. So Presbyterianism was seen by the New England Puritans as a top-down kind of church structure, and they didn't want anything to do with it. Well, you know, the Westminster Assembly was not set up by a church, it was not called by any church. The English Parliament called the Westminster Assembly. So it was seen as a government activity, and the New Englanders didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, in 1648, the um, Puritan community in New England did approve of a, um, a statement of faith. It was called the Cambridge Platform of Church Discipline. Interesting. It took the theology of the Westminster Confession and combined it with a congregational ecclesiology so that each church was independent of all the other churches. Interestingly, if one church, fascinating how these things are, if one church started to do something that other churches didn't like, what they would do is call the civil government in to say, this is a problem, you've got to deal with it. So there was that inconsistency in, um, in New England Puritanism. Um, but as you know from, as you probably know from the Westminster Confession, and uh, from many other documents, the, um, one of the central ideas of that confession of faith was the idea of covenant, the idea of the covenant. And on this, the um, New England Puritans did copy Scottish Presbyterianism on the idea that each nation was in covenant with God. Each nation was in covenant with God and was bound to keep the terms of the covenant. The, the, uh, the, the very ability of the New England Puritans to set a church membership criterion for political activity was an indication of their perception that we, New England, are in covenant with God. Um, and, and if a nation is in covenant with God, well, then all the kinds of things that you saw in the Old Testament came to bear on New England. That is, if, if it's not just if individuals disobey God, 
that you're in trouble. If the corporate community, if New England Puritans as a group disobeyed God, the country, the, the civil community was in danger. You know how that worked in the Old Testament? That, that if Judah as a nation was unfaithful to God, judgment came. And therefore, if, if that's the paradigm, then, then um, if New England is failing to be fully and completely obedient, that's, um, that's in some ways part of a lot of discussions today. Um, we, 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 don't, we don't think of ourselves, I don't, most of us don't, as, as the United States of America being in covenant with God in that sense, and yet there is a significant degree to which you'll see in all kinds of discussions that um, if there's rampant disobedience in our culture, we should expect God's judgment. See, that, that idea that what the group does can impact God's dealing with everyone in the group, even if not everyone in the group is guilty of that particular action. Does that make sense? That, that, that whole idea that uh, New England was in covenant with God. We were going to be a light on the hill to show forth the truths of Scripture. Um, now, what happens? You, you've got this church membership criterion. You, you've, you've got uh, parents who have children and the parents are members of the church and um, they baptize their child and then the child grows up. Suppose the child grows up and um, cannot give his or her own narrative of grace. What do you do with that child? How do you regard that child? Do you relax the narrative of grace requirement? Or do you regard them as totally outside the community? It's a pretty important question. Because as, as time goes on, uh, there are more and more children of, uh, of church members who don't have a narrative of grace. What, what does the community then do? Well, in 1662, a remarkable compromise was achieved. It was called the Halfway Covenant. The Halfway Covenant. Um, in the Halfway Covenant, grandparents could have grandchildren baptized if the parents of the child were not members of the church. What do you think about that? Um, grandparent, member of the church, visible saint. The children were, were baptized and they've now grown into adulthood and they've, they've not got a narrative of grace. And then they have children. How, how are those children regarded. And how, how does one deal appropriately with the idea that the covenant in the Old Testament was to generations after? I um, was in a church, a uh, Presbyterian church in uh, Indiana on one occasion when um, grandparents presented uh, a grandchild for baptism and it was regarded as legitimate. Now in that case, the parents had been killed. Could the grandparents, when there are no parents, the parents are deceased, could the grandparents have the child baptized? Um, is, is this a sign of an creeping liberalism? <laughs> 
in the community? Maybe. It's also a sign that they were really trying hard to work out the implications of their faith. A um, couple of quick items before we have to close. The, um, throughout the 1660s and 70s, the people in England were getting angrier and angrier with the New Englanders because so many of the people in England had friends who had come over and were not allowed to vote. And so throughout the 1660s and 1670s, there were threats to remove the charter which gave self-government to Massachusetts Bay. And in 1684, the charter was annulled, which, which meant that the entire New England scheme could not be continued. The, uh, the specific um, result of the annulling of the charter was that New England had to return to an economically based franchise. It could no longer use a spiritual base to decide who could vote or not vote. But even more important, I think, um, in the 1670s, you began to hear sermon after sermon after sermon uh, from Orthodox, Orthodox preachers uh, arguing that the ability of the New England churches to manage themselves was a divine right and the charter was the means to that divine right. And therefore, any attempt to remove the charter was seen as a form of heresy. I'm sure you're thinking ahead. A hundred, uh, a hundred years later, the same kinds of arguments were used. The, the, the arguments that in order to be obedient to Christ, we must have this political freedom. And it's somewhat relevant today, too. As a matter of fact, the um, charter having been removed, you did see the gradual secularization of New England society. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, this afternoon. But the, 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 the crucial point that I'm making here is, is what is necessary for us to have in order to be fully obedient to Jesus Christ? Must we have the ability to limit the vote in political elections to only those who've proved themselves to be Christians? If, um, if we don't have that right, Sooner or later, as has happened, sooner or later, the non-Christians will outnumber the Christians. And then what will happen to the covenant that has been made with the people of God? This, um, this again, uh, led to all kinds of further splits in the church as uh, individuals and groups of individuals determined that um, they could not, they would not be part of a church establishment that did not have this right of restricting the franchise. Um, important events occurred later in the 1690s that I will talk about this afternoon as we go to Jonathan Edwards. Any questions at all, perhaps? Rebuttals, please. Is that about right? The charter was restored then? The charter, when, 
when New England came here, came to uh, Massachusetts, when, when the Puritans came to Massachusetts in 1630, they had a charter which allowed them complete self-government here in New England, which allowed them, gave them the ability to restrict the vote to church members. In 1684, the English king revoked that charter and reestablished the uh, normal way in which people were to, to be in obedience to the uh, English king. So that uh, it, it, the, the charter which had allowed them to set up the community that they did was revoked in 1684. And many people say that was the beginning of the end of Puritanism. Um, indeed, you see a, a, a book mentioned there, Michael Hall, The Last American Puritan, The Life of Increase Mather. And he lived strictly right, right in the middle of the period that we've been talking about. So what Hall is arguing is what I'm suggesting, and that is that New England Puritanism was, among other things, a concept of a national covenant between people and God. Uh, they, the Puritans, the New England Puritans, believed all the Reformed theology that we believe. What made them distinctive was this idea of a national covenant in which the community was to live in obedience to God. 